Well, I guess to ask about what you were talking about with your first project, with your first book, yeah. my, I guess the question that I was going to come up with or, or present next was this idea of internalized oppression, internalized colonization and how that manifests. And I know um, in reading your interview with uh, Mad in America, um, mm -hmm. we talk about the English language in particular and how that is a signifier of of economic uh, prosperity or, you know, uh, career opportunities. Um, there is this, uh, there's this internalized idea that I guess colonized or post-colonized uh, populations have within a mm. neo-colonial or excuse me, a neoliberal kind of global mm. economic structure. We have to also include that, yeah. um, that, you know, speaking this language, which is a symbol of the legacy of colonization. I mean, speaking English is a part of that. Right. So I just wanted yeah. to ask about the uh, the identity of of those that are living in a kind of post colonial context um, that have internalized some of those, mm. you know, they internalized the values of the colonizers. I guess you could say, um, yeah. I think one project that might be helpful even today to especially speak about the um protests that are happening you know in the aftermath of uh the tragic aftermath of uh george flight's killing and killing of uh, you know brianna taylor's and so many others um is being sort of how one of the questions has been asked is how is how does um you know what is the role of south asians or indians how they're complicit in advancing anti-blackness or white supremacy, you know, how can they undo that? How can they speak about racism within their own communities? And that was, I think, one way that I can speak very clearly, or I can speak in some depth to the question you're asking about um, um, sort of the influence of not just language, languages that can come back to it, but also um, understanding of social caste hierarchies, how they shape, for example, the immigrant diaspora or the South Asian diaspora. And then when they're placed here within the context of racial formation, racial hierarchies in the United States, how, how, they, um, how they respond to that. So let me kind of make it more concrete to you is that um, um, large segments, uh, you know, of um, uh, so-called Asian Americans and also South Asians uh, who live within the United States uh, who are very highly educated came after 1965 were very highly um, educated in the sense they were doctors and engineers and they were able to uh, um, in some ways start out at a very different point uh, as opposed to other uh, migrants, other black um, um, communities and other migrants, such as Latino migrants. Um, and so there's always been an unequal starting point of, in terms of how some of these Asian Americans have done well in terms of their median income. And one way to look at that is to kind of uh, think about why is that the case? You know, there's usually an understanding that somehow these immigrant communities have been able to advance themselves have a piece of the American dream and they're compared unfairly, should they compare to other communities and say, look, these other communities, other racial communities have been here for hundreds of years, but they somehow have not done as well as Asian Americans. So this was in the 1960s, politicians used this model minority politics to create a wedge between these different groups without acknowledging that many of the uh, South Asians came uh, in the 1960s had a very distinct advantage in terms of their education. So they didn't come essentially as working class labor and lived here in structural racism and very disadvantaged life. They came here with professional degrees and were propelled through a system that allowed them to really acquire social mobility. So part of um, answering that question is that, so what are the ways in which then South Asians have been uh, explicit or, or have been um, entangled in um, uh, the project of white supremacy is to sort of not acknowledge the, that 
their advancement has come on the fights and struggles of people of color, black people specifically, who fought, who gave their labor, who made this country over 400 years, fought in the civil rights movement and provided the space for other groups, so to speak, to other immigrant groups to come in. So, uh, so part of my book, American Karma, really asks this question is not just about model minority, but how, like, what does silence mean? What does, you know, what does it mean to be silenced to white supremacy by benefiting from it? What does it mean to be indifferent to your own, so to speak, economic privileges? I'm not suggesting that the South Asians did not experience racism or so. But I, what I point out in my book, there's a paradox there. And the paradox is that many of the South Asians in my book spoke about the racism because of this. You know, I have a chapter called Saris, Chutney Sandwiches and Thick Accents. How their saris that they wore, how the uh, supposedly thick accents they had were made fun of or critiqued or they were racialized and they felt they did not belong here. Either they had a uh, very severe you know, different kinds of, um, um, different kinds of, um, uh, uh, different kinds of experiences of racism, which were highly, highly painful and disruptive. Um, being denied jobs, for example, um, uh, being considered uh, uh, not part of the, um, being considered not as American citizens and so on. But at the same time, they were very afraid to speak about that racism. And that was what internal colonialism, internalized racism means, that you asked me the question of initially. And I wanted to give an explanation that it's not as simple as saying that I have internal colonialism or internalized racism. You have to ask also the questions about how does it work? Where does it come up? And one of this is seeking proximity to whiteness, as I, as I write in my book. So, so these South Asians, and especially Indian Americans who came here, are one of the most successful elite groups, but have largely remained silent for many years uh, on um, calling out the racism that exists within white America, calling out the own racism they have felt. So what they have done instead is they've used what I've shown as three kinds of language to be silent about it. One is I call it the language of meritocracy. That is, we came here because we are successful, look at our degrees, you know, I earned it. This is a meritorious system by which I got my PhD and I advanced myself rather than looking at the structural opportunities that were given to them. Second, they speak about the language of universality. That is, you know, hey, there is racism everywhere. It's in Europe, but it's great to be here. You know, they speak about, I had this interview done by the mother who lived in a particularly white community and spoke about how nobody wants to play with her daughter because the, um, and this was about 25 years ago, and because, you know, they were seen as, as darker people, didn't know them, people were threatened, afraid. But generally, the idea was these were others. This is how she narrates that in my in the interview. But she says the way I'm going to counteract that is to make my child go to an Ivy League school, and make her so uh, advanced and educated that this way they'll have to recognize her. So that's another way to think about internalized colonialism or internalized racism. So she didn't think about the structures that we have in place that were creating her own experiences, rather her answer to it was, you know, let me become a model minority. And so then I asked her the question at that time is that, that um, um, do you think um, you, you had experienced the racism? Do you think this is racism? She completely denied it. She said, you know, no, 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 I'm not saying that. And she's like, racism is everywhere. It's, and, and that's the universality. It's in Africa, it's in India, there's casteism. And then she go, went on to ex ex share her experience of deep racism, but at the same time, she wanted to disavow it in the same breath. And that's the tension I articulate as part of. So there is, there's 
there was complete articulation of our own racism. This is what happened to me. It was so shameful and I felt so inferior that my daughter, nobody wanted to play with it, but I am going to disavow it and keep it contained and I don't want to talk about it. And then she gave answers when I asked her, well, don't you think there is racism? Don't you think, think about all the Latino communities, think about the black children who've gone through this for hundreds of years. At that point, her answer was much more um, in, in this meritocracy and universalist language. And then, uh, and then the third piece, which, is, which I found in answers across my research is what I call colorblind ideology. That is, you find um, many of these uh, participants spoke about uh, the fact that we don't see color. Um, you know, W.E. Du Bois spoke about the problem of the color line, but there's also the problem of the color blind. You know, and here you could actually see her advocating many, many, many positions like her um, that we should we should look at general humanity and not specifically look at uh, race positions and so on. And so, what the outcome of doing that research uh, showed me is this is how internal racism lives, and one very important move as part of the so-called assertions of universality, assertions of sameness, and assertions of universe, uh, individual merit is they're all rooted in this idea that Asian Americans, especially South Asians, are, are a cultural group. So they specifically, very strategically, reposition themselves as a cultural group, as not as a racial group. So then they don't have to think about the racial experiences. So that's something that much of my research found, found out. So what are the mechanisms by which the internalized racism is actually never dealt with? Well, what it does, it just gets repositioned and it lives within the community, within the families, and there's no conversation about it. So one way to do it as a cultural group is to say, look, we belong to a cultural group that's 5,000 years old and we have a very superior civilization. And so they speak not of themselves as Indian Americans, as a cultural group, meaning we have this ethnicity, we have this language and, and framing it in cultural terms, then then gives them a space to be in a multicultural America where they can do their dances and performances and not have to deal with the direct racism that comes from embracing a racial identity where African-Americans and many Latinos don't have a choice. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. They have to almost. So, so those were what I would call. So you asked me to give an answer about internalized racism within my own research. So these are where I'm pointing to very concretely that how they were articulating it as such. 